thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm here with my colleague Jeff Tompkins, so if you attend one of the afternoon breakout sessions, he'll be giving a talk on human-chimp genetic similarity. As our organization title indicates, we are a research organization. Research and education are really the two branches of what we do. We're basically a, a team of full-time scientists who, in our free time, we're not speaking or writing, are doing research. We have a, an active research program pretty much across the origins disciplines. We have astro astronomical research going on, geology research, and then a, a lot of heavy genetic stuff. And what I want to tell you about this morning is some of the research I've been doing. We've got a number of projects ongoing. This is just one of them. I've titled this talk, The Riddle of 6,000 Years. This is really a, an age of the Earth talk, but from biology. And that may seem like a, a strange partnership. I'll, I'll explain the connection more in a moment. But for many folks, the age of the Earth is, is, does seem to be a riddle. We don't have time to derive this. So we're a young Earth creation organization. We would hold to the creation of the universe in the last six to 10,000 years. Here's just some of the reasons why we, how we get that number. We, we take a, a plain reading, hermeneutic, days being basically 24-hour days. Adam and Eve created on day six. Uh, that pair not being in the garden more than 130 years based on Genesis 5-3, where his third son, or Seth, is born when Adam is 130 years old. We take the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 plainly, which if you add them up, based on the Masoretic text, gives you 1,946 years from Adam to Abraham. Septuagint gives you slightly different, a slightly older range if you take the most generous manuscript evidence. About 2,000, maybe 3,000 years Abraham to Christ, and of course 2,000 years Christ until now. So that gives you a range of six to 10,000 years. And I think even those who would not necessarily agree with this would say this is, this is probably the, what the plain reading would say, and oftentimes the different break, difference breaks down in terms of, well, what hermeneutic should we use? Some would argue, well, yes, this is what the plain reading would give you, but there are reasons you shouldn't, shouldn't use the plain reading of the text. Discussing that at length would be a whole other discussion for another day. The riddle is, what do you do with this number and the number that's floated around the vast majority of professional scientists as the age of the Earth, 4.6, 4.5 billion years? That's, a, that's orders of magnitude difference. This creates a real conflict for many people. How do you resolve this? I'm not going to go into, because again, for sake of time, all the ways that uh, geologists, astronomers would argue scientifically for this. But there is one assumption I want to draw out of this. And this is going to tie us to biology. By and large, and this is just a general rule, when you look at the arguments for an ancient Earth, they generally assume a constant rate of change. Of course, there are exceptions. If you look at carbon-14 decay, for example, if the sun's rays have been more intense or less, uh, there's going to be some fluctuation there. I'm saying constant by comparison to, let's say, a young Earth flood geology model. So if you have a global flood, that's obviously going to change rates geologically in a very dramatic way. And so by contrast to a young Earth model, these are basically constant rates of change. Now, what in the world does all of this have to do with biology? Well, once you determine the age for the Earth, this really creates a framework for interpreting the fossil record. So the dates that are, are commonly cited for, let's say, the Cambrian explosion, 500, 530, 542 million years ago, that's going to be within the framework of the age of the Earth. And as you go on up through the fossil layers, those absolute age assignments really go back to some of those same methods used to determine the age of the Earth. Now, what is the fossil record? It is a record of once living creatures. So the fossil record has been used to determine the age of species origin and their demise. Well, there's a second way we can now think about species origin and their demise, and that's genetics, because all species, all living species that we know of, nearly all of them, use DNA as the substance of heredity, and I'll get into the reasons why this acts like a clock. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on what genetics might be able to tell us about when species lived. And actually, we've got projects going on as well about looking at extinction, which we don't have time to get into this morning. I just want to get into this clock question. Genetics can get really complicated really fast, so I, I want to cover just three very basic points that can carry our discussion forward. Doug Axe made some analogies to language, and I think this is probably the best analogy for thinking about DNA. So DNA, 
is the substance of heredity. It's, it's the controlling factor of development. It's probably not the only controlling factor, but from all the evidence we have, it's the major one. You can change DNA in mice, and you get huge effects in development. Some have no effects, but you can definitely get some pretty dramatic ones. Mice, fruit flies, you name it. So DNA is like a book. Books are broken down into chapters, chapters into paragraphs, paragraphs into sentences. Sentences that consist of words with grammar and punctuation that carries meaning. And then ultimately, of course, that meaning is carried by the letters. And the DNA alphabet, unlike the English, consists only of four letters. That may at first pass seem like it's simpler than the English alphabet. However, DNA, as we discover more and more, is actually way more complex. Those four letters, there's three billion of them in our genome, in our book of instructions. Six billion total, three billion from mom, three billion from dad. Those, those carry meaning in the, the way they're arranged. So this is the, a, a crude diagram of the structure of DNA, this twisted ladder-like structure. Think of the rungs of the ladder as the individual letters. So this is a, a huge molecule for humans, broken down into 46 chapters, 46 chromosomes. And these letters have an orientation. So we read English left to right. You read DNA, in this case, up and down. But you can read it bottom to top, backwards, forwards. The amount of complexity, the rules of grammar and punctuation at the molecular level, so to speak, are really boggling the mind. But for our discussion, all we really need to know is that DNA is this chemical alphabet. Those letters, arranged in a particular way, carry meaning. That's the first point to know. Second point to know is that DNA, as it's passed on each generation, is passed on imperfectly. So here I've drawn a very simple pedigree for sake of illustration. You have the grandparents' generation. They have a son. He marries a wife. They have a son. Three generations here. And I've tried to illustrate their DNA content next to each image. So grandpa has two copies of DNA. He has one from his mother, his father. Grandma has two copies of her DNA. Same with her son. There's a lot of detail we have to skip over just because it gets complex and isn't immediately relevant to our discussion. But he reshuffles some of his DNA, passes on one copy. Grandma reshuffles her DNA, passes on some of, some of her to her son. But as they copy, reshuffle, and pass it on, mistakes happen. So a good way to think about this is let's say you're tasked with transcribing a book. You've got it sitting next to you, and you're tasked with transcribing and you're not allowed to stop and make corrections. And you're not allowed to use the spell checker. So you're just sitting here typing, typing away. There's a good chance you're going to make mistakes. And then if you take that copy, transcribe it again, more mistakes. And that's, that's really how generational inheritance happens. Grandma and Grandpa, on average, pass on 60 mistakes. They make 60 typos. Now compared to a 3 billion letter or 6 billion letter genome, book of instructions, that's, that's a pretty small fraction. And the same thing happens at this generation. He marries a wife. They copy, reshuffle their DNA, but make some mistakes in the process, and so pass on changes to their son. I have two kids. My daughter just was born in April. We've passed on mistakes to her. And so each generation, more and more mistakes accumulate. And you can see that as more and more time passes, more and more generations occur, the amount of mistakes is going to increase more and more. To go from this generation to this generation, 60 have happened. Here, another 60, which means to go from grandpa to grandson, that's a total 60 plus 60, 120. The rate of change for those 3 billion letters, that's, that's what's been published in the literature. So that's the second thing to note. This process of inheritance happens imperfectly. And that's supposed to be then, of course, the engine of evolution. Now, there's something else we want to talk about, though, not necessarily the engine of evolution. Our interest is time. Well, the fact that changes happen allows us to establish genealogy and to think of DNA like a clock. So let's look at the males in this genealogy, grandpa, son, and grandson. We know the differences among them. And let's say you're a forensic investigator. And you're not told who these three individuals are. You're just told, here are three individuals. Here's the DNA differences among them. Because with time and with more generations, more DNA mistakes occur, more typos happen, you can know that this relationship here and this relationship here are closer genealogically than this generation here. 
and if you're a forensic investigator, and then you're told, well, there's three generations here, you can immediately say, this is the deeper genealogical relationship, or the more distant one. One of these guys is the grandfather, one of them is the grandson. Now, you're not going to know, without more information, which is which, but you know that this branch of the relationship is the more distant one. And you can apply this now not just to immediate families, you can apply this to different ethnic groups. So let's say this guy is a Spaniard. And let's say you get a male from Russia, and you get a male from Australian Aborigine. And let's just say, for sake of argument, that, we, that the DNA differences, the amount of mistakes, changes among these guys, is uh, what I've shown on the screen. So the Spaniard and the Russian have 500 differences between them. The Russian and the Australian, the Aborigine, have 1,000 and the Australian and the Spaniard, also 1,000. So you can infer that these guys share a closer ancestor than either the Russian and the Aborigine or the Spaniard and the Aborigine. These guys have a great, 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 great grandfather, however many greats you put in there. There are fewer greats in this relationship than either of these relationships. They have a more distant common ancestor. That's the basic principle. And so you can see then DNA differences measure genealogy, and they act like a clock. The longer that a species has been on the planet, the more differences accumulate over time. That's the basic principle we're going we're to run with. Now let's think of this from a biblical perspective. Genesis 9 says all modern individuals are descended from Noah and his family. So Genesis 9 paraphrase basically says from these three sons of Noah, the whole earth was repopulated. So all the different ethnic groups we see all come from Noah and his family. Now, if they've been around for, if humans have been around for a long time, they should have a lot of genetic differences. If they've been around a short time, they should have few genetic differences. For technical reasons we can't get into in this morning session, there's only a few subsets of DNA sequence that act like a simple clock. Let me digress here for a moment to address something uh, Biologos community has brought up. They'll say, if you look at the amount of genetic differences among humans today, there are too many for humans to have originated recently and to have originated from two people. There's a hidden assumption in that statement. From an evolutionary perspective, all diversity is the product of typos. That's the engine of evolution that has to explain where everything came from. What's not considered is the possibility that God may have created Adam and Eve with some genetic diversity in the beginning. So one other detail that we sort of glossed over, we all have two copies of our DNA sequence, one from mom, one from dad, and one copy from each parent gets passed on each generation. So Adam would have had two copies of DNA, Eve would have had two copies of DNA, why should they have been four identical copies? You know, there's some chromosomal differences, male, female, XY, but that aside, the rest of the DNA, should that have been identical? My guess is probably not, because if it was, all their descendants would have been clones. And so I think it's reasonable to say there was genetic diversity from the start. And if you then allow for that, you can easily explain genetic diversity uh, across the genome for these different ethnic groups. So the, the biologist arguments, all of them, are based on some sort of erroneous assumption either about Adam and Eve making clones or assuming humans and chimpanzees do have a common ancestor. And again. Jeff Tompkins will address some of the genetics behind the human ape question this afternoon. End of digression. Back to our story. What actually functions like a clock? Theoretically, the Y chromosome could. How many Y chromosomes were there in the beginning? One. Men are XY, females are XX. One male in the beginning. All Y chromosome differences among men today are the results of typos. We don't have a good measure of the rate of change, though, for the Y chromosome. We have to go to a different clock. One more digression here, and this is cell biology. So as you're sitting here this morning digesting your breakfast, you've chewed it up, passed it to your stomach, stomach to the intestine, intestine to the bloodstream, bloodstream to cells. The cells pass it on to mitochondria, which are basically little energy factories. Simplified explanation, they, they take those chemical constituents, break them down into the component parts, extract the energy from those chemical bonds, allowing you to breathe and allowing your heart to beat. So you can praise the Lord for mitochondria. They also have, for purposes of our discussion, a tiny little section of DNA that codes for some of those proteins involved in breaking down uh, foodstuffs. It's only about 16 to 17,000 letters long in humans. So that's a tiny fraction compared to 3 billion. But it's, it's very important for our discussion. 
So all of us have it because all of us are sitting here alive. Males and females have it. But only females pass it on, at least for the species we've been able to observe, at least for humans. Females pass it on. So my two children got their mitochondrial DNA not from me, but from my wife. So at the time of the flood, if we're just thinking from this perspective, Noah and Mrs. Noah, whatever her name was, both had mitochondrial DNA, but their three boys got their mitochondrial DNA from mom, not from Noah. Well, where did their children get their mitochondrial DNA from? Not from these boys, from their wives. Now, where did their wives get their mitochondrial DNA from? Their mothers, and it's, I don't think scripture indicates whether that was Mrs. Noah. My guess is unlikely that these were sisters. My guess is they were not. So ultimately, their DNA comes from and traces back to Adam and Eve. So it's legitimate to talk about mitochondrial Eve that, that fits the biblical narrative. So let's think about this then. Uh, re redraw our little diagram here. All modern ethnic groups, in terms of their mitochondrial DNA, trace that back to Adam and Eve. So one little point I forgot to add. Both Adam and Eve would have had mitochondrial DNA. Adam needed to breathe to eat his breakfast, so he would have had some mitochondria, but only his wife passed them on. So it does go back to one individual. Now, all modern differences among us, among different ethnic groups, therefore are the product of this process of imperfect inheritance. Mitochondrial DNA is passed on. It's passed on imperfectly. Mistakes happen. And so you can relate the amount of differences today to the rate of typos, the rate of mutations and time. This is straight actually from an evolutionary textbook. And so we can, we can set up sort of a, a relative comparison. If humans have been around for a long period of time and have gone through a lot of generations, there should be a lot of mistakes that have accumulated. If they've been around for a short period of time, so I'm just going to illustrate that by arrows, lots of arrows. If there's a, if there's a big number here, and we know this rate, there should be a big number here. If there's a small number here, by contrast, there should be a small number here. Well, this rate's been measured. It's been published in the evolutionary literature. There's been a lot of controversy about it. I read a technical paper where I reviewed all 15 or so secular publications on that. Anyway, so if you want the details, you can look at that. So we have this rate, and then we can just apply a time scale here. Now, in the, in the conference proceedings, I think I used the number 180,000. For technical details, again, what I won't get into, 50,000 is probably the, the more appropriate number. And here's the results of that prediction. The height of each of these bars represents the average amount of differences that should, or typos, that should have occurred in that time scale. One more technical detail, we're looking at a small subsection of mitochondrial DNA, because that's the only section for which this rate has been measured. So if the numbers uh, don't look immediately obvious at first pass, there's a technical reason behind it. Anyway, differences equals rate times time. So after 50,000 years, there should be on average about 50 differences among modern humans. That black bar represents the best possible guess. So in, in technical terms, that's the 95% confidence interval, not the standard deviation. So this is the best possible range of guesses. There's a range because there's always some sort of statistical error associated with biological measurements. So you have anywhere from 35 to about a little over 80 differences should be present among modern humans if they've been around 50,000 years. You can do the same calculation from a, a young Earth perspective. So I'm using 10,000 years sort of as the upper limit. And so if humans have been around only 10,000 years, if that's when mitochondrial Eve lived, then there should be a range of 7 to 16 differences. And what do we actually see? On average, about 13 differences falls right in the range here, and it's lower than what this predicts. It's not a huge difference, and so this may not be that worth, it may not have been worth talking about if that's really how small the differences are. Well, there's three other species for which the mutation rate in mitochondrial DNA has been measured. The water flea, uh, the genus, this is Daphnia pulex, the fruit fly, Drosophila, and roundworms. And we can use a similar sort of scenario to make some predictions. So let's assume for sake of argument, when God created water fleas, he created two. Now my guess is he created a lot more than that, but it makes the math easier if you just assume two. So we're going to assume there were two water fleas in the beginning. Evolutionists would say there, were, there was probably a, an ancestral pair or some sort of ancestral population from which modern water fleas descend. And so that's sort of time zero for the origin. And over time, then, modern water fleas having a common ancestor back then, 
have accumulated differences. Water fleas pass on the mitochondrial DNA. They do it imperfectly. And so differences accumulate over time. And you can use that same equation to relate the amount of differences over time uh, to the mutation rate. And once again, we'll use the same sort of comparison. If they've been around a long period of time, this multiplied by the rate should give a lot of differences. If they've been around a short period of time, you multiply a small number by the rate, you should get a small number of differences. And then here's the numbers. So from the evolutionary literature, they'd say water fleas evolved 7.6 million years ago. In that time period, they should have accumulated an average of 140,000 differences. I'll talk about the meaning of that in a moment. Again, the black bar represents the 95% confidence interval, or the best possible range of guesses. So a lower limit here is 122,000 differences. After 10,000 years, 162 to 210, actual number differences 646. Now this, to me, is pretty close. Again, we've used oversimplifying assumptions. So as far as I'm concerned, this predicts it pretty tightly. And here we have an orders of magnitude difference. Now, let's ask a question. If these guys had undergone a whole bunch of mutations, how many differences would we actually be able to detect? Well, the actual number of letters in their mitochondrial genome is, about, is less than 20,000. So if they had mutated mutated, they'd probably only have about 20,000 differences. Now, this is still much lower than that. And the reason I display the data this way is because what that means practically then is these guys would have undergone typos throughout the entire sequence multiple times over. So they'd have mutated all 20,000, 14,000 letters, and then done it again, and then done it again. So I think there's, there's three takeaways from this diagram. First is this time scale matches pretty close to the actual number of differences. This is much less than mutational saturation. So 20,000 differences, 14,000 differences. That's the second point. And I think there's a concern about viability here. Could these guys survive 7.6 million years of mutational change? So that's water fleas. Same thing now with fruit flies. Same song, third verse. Assume there were two in the beginning. Again, oversimplifying assumption, but makes the math easier. Assume that all water, or excuse me, fruit flies have a common ancestor. So young earth creationists, evolutionists would agree on this. And that over time, uh, through the process of imperfect inheritance, differences have accumulated. We'll use that same simple equation. And again, the same predictions hold true. If you've got a big number here, big number here, small number here, you're going to have a small number here. And uh, this diagram shows the data. Height of the bar, height of this column here represents the average prediction. This looks like a huge variation. Again, that's the 95% confidence interval, not the standard deviation. If it was standard deviation, this would be basically meaningless, but that's the best possible range of guess. Again, notice the scale here. So the lower end of this is near 100,000. That's the prediction after 20 million years. That's a number I took from the evolutionary literature. Evolutionists would say these guys, Drosophila, originated, evolved 20 million years ago. You look at the Young Earth time scale, they would have been created 10,000 years ago. So here's the range of number of differences, number of typos after 10,000 years. Here's the actual range within this genus. So the same three takeaways. There's an overlap. The genome size in these guys is about 14,000. So this is still much less than 14,000 mutational saturation. And again, they would have made typos to their entire genome multiple times over. That's why I'm displaying the data that way. Roundworm, you can guess, you know, same routine, same song, fourth verse. Two, assume two in the beginning, that they would have reproduced over time, imperfect inheritance. Differences are a product of the rate of typos over time. We'll use the same sort of, we can make the same sort of relative expectations. And here's the actual results. So height of the bar, about 2.5 million differences in 18 million years. That number, again, I take from the evolutionary literature. The range, the 95% confidence interval, is that the height of this black bar. Lower end is 1.7 million differences. Here's the actual differences, and here's the prediction of the Young Earth model. Same three takeaways. There's good overlap here. This is much less than mutational saturation, which would be 14 or 20,000 differences. And again, these guys, looks like, would have mutated their genomes multiple times over. Now, just a couple takeaways from what we've discussed, and then we can go to questions. I think what we're seeing here is something new. So from my observation of the origins debate, the different positions tend to break down 
based on discipline. And I think that's a, a, a function of the history of the debate. So where has the age of the Earth discussion been in times past by and large? Largely astronomy and uh, geology. And so you can talk about age of the Earth uh, and geology and astronomy and reject maybe what the evolutionists say in the biological realm. So I think with the advent of genetics now, we don't really have a, an age-neutral field. With the fact of imperfect inheritance, not biology does say something about age. And so that's, I think, the first takeaway from looking at these data. Second takeaway is that there seems to be a, a conflict here with this ancient time scale and the actual number of differences. We don't have time to go through some possible objections to this. Uh, I'll tell you about an article. I, I think I go through some of the objections and responses in the, in the proceedings book. I've got an article on our website, too, that goes through this. And thirdly, we see that it confirms the young Earth time scale. So how do we move the discussion forward? So some, some historical context. For many years, young Earthers uh, and, the, and the modern young Earth movement really didn't start until the last, 1961 was the publication of the Genesis Flood. ICR was founded in 1970. And so it's fairly recent compared to 1859, publication of The Origin of the Species. So young Earthers haven't had as much time as the evolutionists to develop their model. We don't get NIH grants, as neither do really most creationists. So one of the criticisms that's often been levied against the young Earth community is if you really have an idea, and this is a criticism that's been unfortunately levied against the intelligent design community as well, you know, make a testable prediction. The real test of the strength of a scientific idea is its ability to make testable, accurate predictions in the real world. And of course, they, they caricature intelligent design as God of the gaps, which is not true if you've read any of the ID literature, uh, old Earth literature. And here, I think what we're seeing is now the young Earth model is making predictions as well. So this is four species. It's four independent species, three different phyla. From an evolutionary perspective, they share a, a deep evolutionary connection. So I think we've got a a significant statistical sampling, obviously much more we could do. Well, here we have a venue then in which we can make predictions. These, these are really retrodictions. I'm taking the published rates of change from the evolutionary literature and then making some retrodictions, seeing how it lines up. So the real test, the real challenge going forward is, can the evolutionary community make testable predictions? And let's think about the significance. We're talking about the engine of evolution. If there's anything that should confirm that life evolved by natural processes, mutations should bear it out. And what we're seeing is mutations don't bear it out. And in, in fact, the success of these retrodictions gives me confidence that I'm willing to make predictions about species for which the rate hasn't been measured. So let's do an experiment. Let's get some evolutions together, creations together. Let's make a prediction. I think I can predict the rate of change for dogs, the rate of change for cats. You, you name it. I think we have a good metric here in place. And so whatever metric that the evolutionists would come up with to try to explain these current data to make some accurate retrodictions, the real test of that idea will be, can it make successful predictions in the future? That's, I think, the way to, to move this discussion forward. Now a brief commercial about ICR. <laughs> we do have a free monthly magazine, Acts and Facts. Uh, I, I, I wrote up some of these data for the April issue. I highly recommend if you haven't signed up for this, well, for one, it's free. And two, because we have an active research program, this is a great way to keep up with what we're doing. We'll, of course, first publish in peer-reviewed literature. Once that gets accepted, we'll let you know what's, what we found here. So if you want to keep abreast of what we're doing, uh, please sign up for that. You can go to our website, which I'll show you again in a moment. I'm going to open up to your, for questions in a second. If you, get, if you have questions that don't get answered today, or if you think of one Thursday, and I'm not around to answer it. I did create a public Facebook page for the purpose of making dialogue easier. We used to have a full-time guy on staff who would just answer questions all day. Budget cuts 2010 means we don't have any more. So if you email the website, you might get lost in the ether. And so to avoid getting lost in the ether, I made this page so you can ask questions. And our flagship web website is icr.org. We have 40 years worth of articles and research we've done. We have uh, every other day, I think now we do news articles, updates. So if you want to keep a pulse on what's going on, uh, this, is a, this is a great place for it. If you have children, grandchildren going off to college, again, loads of stuff that's free. 
a great resource for looking up things to deal with what happens in class or writing papers, you name it. Uh, that's, that's the best place to go. So thank you so much for your attention. I'll stop now and open the floor for questions. Yes, ma'am. So that's a good question. Are mistakes always bad? And that's a, let me try to answer that a couple different ways. So empirically, are mistakes always bad? Actually, let's, let's back up even more. How do we identify mistakes? So I alluded to earlier that evolutionists will assume that every difference is a mistake. And they've excluded from the start, for example, with humans, the possibility that God created differences. Now, how am I identifying mistakes here? By looking at differences. And the reason I'm calling these mistakes is because I think, from a young Earth perspective, and even from an evolutionary perspective, we'd both agree there was a single sequence in the beginning. There's really no possibility, it seems, for created differences. And so, therefore, all differences we see in mitochondrial DNA are mistakes. Now, that's, again, a tiny fraction of DNA the vast majority of our DNA we haven't talked about, and that's where I think these created differences show up. Now, a practical application. There's the HapMap project that's ongoing. NIH is, I think it's the NIH that's funding it, looking for genetic correlations to disease uh, with all this genetic data, trying to find what are the molecular components that underlie cancer, et cetera. So motivation's good. But I think what they're doing is assuming that every variation is a mutation and therefore could be bad. When I think the vast majority of what we're seeing has been created and isn't bad. So I'm anxious to see where these data go. And so one other big picture ramification of that, I've, I've largely viewed the creation evolution debate sort of as an isolated discussion over origins with few present day ramifications. Well, here's here's an issue for which you probably have present-day ramifications. Where are we going to go looking for the underlying causes of disease? One other piece of uh, line of evidence to consider. When it comes to this three billion letter sequence in humans, uh, based on what the, what, what the community has published so far, there's what they classify as common variants and rare variants, and it's basically a, a mathematical cutoff. If it's present in this percentage of the population, it's common. If it's percent, uh, present in this percentage or lower, it's a rare variant. Most of those common variants, or probably all of them, stem back to Adam and Eve. And I think from discussion with a, a colleague of mine, most of them come in only one of two copies. There's four possible varieties for every position, four letters of DNA. Most only come in two, as if there was two varieties in the beginning. There's been recent publications where they say these rare variants have an origin in the last 5,000 years, which I think is consistent with a mutational origin from Noah and his family. And these are also the ones that I think are being associated with disease, if I'm remembering the data correctly. So back now to your original question, how do you know what's a mistake and is it bad? If you can reliably identify a mistake, or a change, that's really the question. Let's choose a neutral term. If you can accurately identify a change, my guess is it's probably degradative or neutral. So in the origins discussion, especially in the young earth community, there's often been the idea thrown around that most mutations are bad, which is an attractive idea. I just haven't seen a publication that actually quantifies that. Uh, my guess is a lot of changes are probably functionally neutral. Some are obviously deleterious. You can look at sickle cell anemia. You can look at cystic fibrosis. Clear genetic origin. You can trace it to this DNA change. But, the, but really, I think it's an open question. Uh, for the purpose of our discussion, I think from either an evolutionary or a creation perspective, they're mistakes, they're changes, they're not created. But when we're talking about the vast majority of other differences, now we're getting into a sticky question. So I don't know if that answers it. That was a long answer to a short question. But it gets very complicated very quickly. Yes? Uh, the section of uh, mitochondrial DNA that you're measuring these mutations on, yes. is there a known function for that section? So, the, so, the, so for humans, it was just the D loop. For the other species, we're looking at the whole genome. And mitochondrial DNA is somewhat different from the 3 billion letters because it's very gene dense. So virtually the whole, most of the 16 letters codes for a protein. 
whereas the vast majority of the three billion letters uh, is what evolutionists thought once was junk because it didn't look like it coded for proteins. Now we know it is functional. But uh, anyway, so most of that sequence we know does something because it codes for a protein. Uh, and your original question was, say it again. Yes, that's what I, that's what I anticipate, uh, and I think I put that in the, in the proceedings. So one response might be, well, selection is going to eliminate those that are deleterious, which is a, a legitimate response. I think the real challenge then is, OK, can you make a prediction based on the time scale and the, the element of selection that accurately models the amount of differences? So sure, and even as a young Earth creationist, I'd say there's probably some things. I mean, I'm, in a sense, I'm kind of shocked that you can actually get this many differences that survive. Because mitochondrial DNA, coding for proteins that perform essential functions in the cell, energy generation, you, know, you knock out mitochondria, you're going to die. How can these survive? So yes, surely selection must play a role. I think the challenge is, based on a selection model, can someone make a prediction about what we see today? And so I would say, yes, I think I can from a Youngeth perspective. And if, from a different perspective, selection may play a role, I think the real test of that hypothesis is, can it make a prediction about what we see today? Can you predict the rate of change? Yes? What do, do the creationist uh, genetics think about all of this hullabaloo about Neanderthal DNA? Neanderthal DNA. OK, something we didn't talk about. Where do the fossil DNA sequences fit in? Uh, probably a couple different responses. I think the biggest question in my mind is, is the sequence accurate? And I don't know that we have any, or let me, let me rephrase it, maybe some background, and then I'll make that statement. So we're talking about very labile molecules, break down easily. I mean, every molecular biologist knows this. You isolate DNA, you stick it in the freezer. Uh, you stick it in the minus 80 freezer, minus 80 degrees Celsius, if you want it to last, because it breaks down. So would these bones from Neanderthals, think whatever, would any sort of fossil or skeletal remain have DNA that has a reliable sequence? So we already know, and the evolutionists know, some of the mechanisms of degradation. We know it degrades from the ends, and so they'll look at the, 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 the middle sequence. My concern is. Yes, we know these mechanisms of degradation. How do we know that there hasn't been some degradation in the middle of that sequence as well? And if we're talking about tiny percentage differences, uh, then I think it gets dicey. Now, they might say, well, we find some of the same differences. Again, how do we know it's not the same process? We know that there's DNA exists in three dimensions. There's a very, uh, and this is actually one of the hottest areas of research right now. It's three-dimensional arrangement of the nucleus and how that affects function. So, it's still an open question to me. My, my colleagues would say it's probably been settled. It's still a concern in my mind. I don't know that it's reliable. And so I don't know that there's anything I can say at this point. I can make arguments from a young Earth perspective that lead me to think it's probably still degraded. But this is within a young Earth framework and wouldn't hold any weight in an in a opposing model discussion. But that's, that's my personal perspective. I think it's still degraded. And I, I hesitate to make any conclusions from it. Oh, and Jeff can tell you. He's done a lot of work on the Neanderthal DNA, actually corresponded with some of the folks. So see Jeff Tompkins afterwards. They, I think they can, they'll find you afterwards if, if, they, if you have a discussion. Some of it, he's had basically confidential interactions with some of these folks doing the original research. So since we're taped, figure talk to him one on one. Yes? Yeah. Been at the fall, would it have accelerated or been a change in the timeline somewhat? Good question. Is it, so I've assumed basically constant rates of change throughout. Would it be legitimate to invoke a faster rate of change or a change in the rate of change? Yeah. To, you know, baseball 10 years was growing, there was yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So maybe another question to ask before that is, was DNA inheritance perfect, or would it have been perfect in a pre-curse, pre-fall world? I don't know. Again, I think we're thinking about, from a young Earth perspective, a small window of time. They weren't, they weren't in the garden more than 130 years. So how would that affect modern diversity today? I don't know that it would in a mathematically relevant sense. So the actual number of differences among modern humans is very small. The average rate of change is one every other generation or one every fifth generation. So if no generations have passed before the fall, I don't know that we can get at that question from a young Earth perspective. Surely something did happen, something biologically relevant, but I think the comparison is pre-fall, post-fall, and I don't know that we have any access to changes that were happening in, in the pre-fall world, at least given our current tools. Yes? Why is the mitochondrial uh, DNA passed just through the female? Why is it passed just through the female? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the functional reason for it. Uh, that just has what's been discovered. Good question. Anyone else? Well, thank you so much. We'll be around again. Jeff Tompkins is doing a, a talk this afternoon. Oh. I missed a question. Excuse me. Another, another question, is there, so I think there's multiple, from a young Earth perspective, thinking about Earth history, there are multiple occasions when we could plausibly invoke a rate of change. Looking at the match between the data and the predictions, my thought is, it looks like there wasn't. Uh, again, from my, I think from a young Earth perspective, when you think geology and some of these other fields, we've traditionally gone with a non-constant rate view, and so I'm a little surprised that there is a match using this simplifying assumption. So currently, I don't have any data to suggest that. Uh, part of the challenge is, with biological data, there's a lot of statistical variability. When we're thinking about modeling pre-flood, post-flood, two-thirds of history on a young Earth time scale is post-flood. One-third is pre-flood. And do we have the mathematical precision to, re to resolve that? Currently, I don't think so. If you do a power calculation, you need a, and given the slow rate of human mutation rate, you need an enormous amount of individuals. Uh, and then questions of population structure begin to play a role. If it's only every other generation, chance effects play a role. So I don't know that we can answer that with, with precision currently. One other one that I missed, I guess. I, I wanted to know where you came up with the number of 130 years in the garden. Oh, so Genesis 5, 3, I think it's Adam lived 130 years, had a son named Seth, and so he's at least son number 3, therefore the events of Genesis 4 and of Genesis 3 must occur before that. Can we assume that Adam couldn't have stayed away from Eve too long? Uh, he was pursuing her and they probably came after the fall, the first two sons? Oh, I'm saying uh, as an upper limit. So my guess is they probably weren't there that long. I, I'm, I, what I, I, I phrase it that way because someone asked me, well, could you put a long period of time there? I'd say from a young Earth perspective, I don't think so because we have that number. And so you just you subtract nine months, nine months, and so you can go backwards. But yeah, did, were they kicked out of the garden fast? My guess is probably yes. And so no more than 130 years or no more than 127 years, or you go even further back because my guess is Cain and Abel were young adults when they had their fatal, fatal encounter. But I picked that number because that's the number of Genesis 5.3, and that to me is an upper limit from which you can easily probably uh, dial it back down.